Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Karthik Odapali. I'm a senior solutions architect in AWS, focusing on Amazon.com as a customer. I primarily work with Prime Video and Amazon InfoSec organizations within Amazon. And I have with me today my colleague, Parvinder Singh. He's a senior data engineer in Amazon.com and Prime Video. And today, we're going to be talking about how Prime Video processes petabytes of analytics at scale. So before we get into the agenda, can I get a quick show of hands? How many of you heard of AWS? <laughs> well, it's going to make our conversation so much easier. So in today's agenda, we're going to talk about a brief history about the Prime Video team that built this platform. We're going to talk about the AWSification part of their uh, architecture, how AWS came and helped them evolve their platform, build a platform, and make evolution on top of that. Then we're going to dive deep into the metric governance. Which metrics are important? How do we decide what is a false positive or which one is a negative? Things of that nature. We're going to talk about metric governance. And then we're going to get into implementation examples, differences between clickstream versus playback data, live versus VOD data. How do we do that? How do we actually implement those examples? We're going to get into that as well. And finally, some conclusion, some takeaways of the learnings that we saw and we had to adapt to as part of this journey so we can share that with you so you can do that in your infrastructure, in your architecture. So to give you a brief history, we have many original hits, Emmy-winning hits like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel or even like Jack Ryan. How many Jack Ryan fans in the house? Awesome, I love John Krasinski. So if you look at the platform itself, we, they originally started from four countries to 200 in one go. So to have a platform that supports 200 countries and territories together, that's a massive jump. And it really went from being a very small pizza team to a global team. How can we have an architecture that can support such massive growth? And with business growth, tech evolution needs to happen. Just because one hand is going above doesn't mean this one shouldn't. It should simultaneously go up. So your tech evolution needs to happen with your business evolution. And how do we create a platform that's constantly innovating on behalf of our customers? Yes, you love Jack Ryan. Yes, you love Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. But how can we continue giving you more content so we have a very big platform to serve your needs? And if you look at the video catalog, that's one side of the equation. But if you look at live sports, that's a totally different ball game. When you talk about sheer traffic, right? VOD catalog or video on demand catalog can be something, it's, it's a static asset, right? So you can have that something on your data lake, on your S3, propagate to that cloud front. Pretty much, you know, the problem is almost solved. But if you look at live sport, this is live streaming traffic that is hitting your website. The problem statements are completely different. You have to understand. Real-time analytics, near real-time will not work. So how do we create a platform that supports not just video-on-demand platform, but also live streaming traffic? And to make matters even better, just this week, Prime Video launched English Premier League. And Prime Video is the sole provider for broadcasting this. No more TV providers, just Prime Video to broadcast English Premier League in UK. And if you talk about sheer traffic, EPL generated three times the more traffic of all prior video traffic combined. So again, how do we do that? How do we evolve a platform that can solve such massive growth or will address customers at that scale? Now, let's look at the AWSification part of things. If you look at the 10,000 feet view of all the services that Prime Video uses, we have our traditional EC2 fleets of EC2 clusters. These guys are doing the heavy lifting part on our day-to-day -day operations. It's not just about analytics. These EC2 instances are also doing custom DRM work, many more things that traditionally cannot be done in serverless technologies, longer running transactions that we had to look uh, lean towards EC2. Then we also had Amazon Redshift. When you gather such petabytes and petabytes of data, we need to have a data warehousing platform that would scale or meet that demand. So Redshift was the obvious answer for that. So just to give you an example of the size of data, when you have millions and mil hundreds of millions of rows and you like to do a join on that table, you need a platform that will scale, 
a platform that will do auto scale for you, so you don't need to have fleets of clusters waiting for you to send a very large query. And Redshift helped us get that scalable data warehousing solution. Next, we had Amazon EMR. EMR on Spark, uh, it helped us do the transformation or the ETL part of things. We obviously had to add a lot of business logic, a lot of b uh, business intelligence engineers had to add their custom logic to make sure that the data that we're getting in real time has the right value to it. We can gather all the data that we want, but without the business intelligence, it means nothing. And EMR, the platform, allowed us to do that. And then S3, beloved S3. It's our data lake. We've been using that as our landing zone for all of our raw data. And all the transformed data has also been stored on S3, so it is literally our data lake. And then Lambda. So Lambda uh, was giving us the no operational overhead advantage. For transactions that could be finished in less than 15 minutes, we obviously use Lambda for that because we don't have to provision EC2 clusters. We don't have to run security patches for our AMIs. It was beautiful and no-brainer. It was not just these five services. We also used CloudFormation for infrastructure as code. Uh, we used CloudWatch for all the monitoring and logging. We used KMS to store our, store our secrets, SNS for all the notification or alerts when you know, things were hitting the fan. And we also had many internal uh, ETL tools that we used to you know, help support this platform. And now to actually peel the onion, I'm going to have Parvinder come up on stage. Thanks, Karthik. Well, hello and welcome. My name is Parvinder. Um, well, uh, just moving on from what Karthik mentioned, how Prime Video evolved from just being in four countries to 200 plus countries and territories. An analytical team within the Prime Video, this is what we have gone through. We have gone through like a similar evolution. We had to sort of scale up our services and everything to have such a bigger traffic. To do that, um, let's talk about how we started. Like, once upon a time, many years ago, it was just like one central data engineering team with one data set. One to one, pretty good old days. We were generating the data, we were producing all the reports, which meant all the numbers were matching. A typical BI problem, you know, when you have multiple reports generating from the same data sets, numbers don't match. So that was a good old time. Then with the growth of the business, we, we had to evolve. We had now more BI teams embedded locally into the, into the business teams because they had to do. Local teams, this is where they could do more ad hoc reporting. They can move faster. They have more local business knowledge. This is where we started to see that although we had like one data set, now N teams start generating reports. Numbers don't match. We even had like a few escalations that why numbers are not matching. We, this is where we tried a very light touch matrix governance. By that, I mean, how do we define different definitions? What are the metrics that are built on these definitions? How to ensure they stay consistent? Moving on with the growth, now suddenly it's like N ratio, and we have now too many teams building too many different data sets, building different reports, a sort of Excuse me, it's like, like a total chaos. We needed to have a mechanism. And this is where sort of, this is like a big chunk of this presentation. Now, what are these different mechanisms? Uh, we have split it into three different parts. First is matrix governance. Like, what is the actual process? How we go through, how to define these definitions, how to build metrics on them, how to ensure they stay consistent and updated and goes through all the hundreds of downstream redshift teams and clusters. Once we have done that, we ensure that we apply this business logic onto the data platform that we own. So we are, again, a data platform team. Once the definitions are done, they come to us. We build these data sets, push it to the data lake. And again, this is a role-based access model. It's like a dumping ground for all the data, but only once you have access, you are granted access, you can consume this data. Let's talk about all these three um, in detail. So matrix governance. As I talked about earlier, um, we, had, we tried to have this sort of uh, matrix governance earlier in the earlier stage as well, where it was sort of left on good intentions. We were speaking to different teams that, hey, every time you build new data sets or you're building new reports, you should come speak to us. But this time, we wanted to do it in a much better way. 
So we certainly, how we do? We have like scheduled meetings, a regular cadence, people need to come to these meetings every time there is a new definition or there is a change. Now how do we do? We would ask them to present documents. This document would have, say, let's take an example, maybe there are a couple of definitions in circulation of the same metric. We ask them to list both the definitions, ask them to do a matrix divergence analysis. So we go through, if we move from definition A to definition B, what's the change, what's the percent change? Once we have gone through that, we push it through an internal tool, something called approvals chain. And this is more like, this is just a nice UI built on top of a system where you have like two entry points. One is a tech assessor. So once we have defined the definition, let's talk about as if like, like even plain SQL. Like this, these are all the weird clauses. This is how we define this definition. It goes through a tech assessor, which could be a BIE, could be a data engineer in the team. Once they approve, it goes through the business approver, which could be a business, a business team, a finance team. Once both approves, it has passed the approval chain, and this is where it comes to the next stage, where how do we apply that? So again, now taking a step back, we are a, a data engineering, a data platform team. We gather data from multiple sources. It could be, it could be a service team, it could be other data engineering teams, who have, put, who have consumed data from their upstream, once we have, again, something we call as data primitives, once we have the data with us through n number of different technologies, which we will go through in a bit, we apply the business logic, which we have just talked about, or in the matrix governance part. Then we push it to the data lake. This data lake is, again, built on uh, S3. And of course, we have tables, as data lakes are meant for, like the physical uh, persistent table. But again, we did one more thing here, was to build views on the top of the data lake. Again, this is again one of the key points, and we will go through why we needed views. Moving on, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the actual data lake. Very simple PubSub mechanism. Probably many of you might have uh, heard of this or are already using. So we have top layer, we have producers. It could be a data engineering team, could be any team or any individual. They might use Redshift, they might use EMR, maybe they want to decouple storage from compute, so they use EMR. Maybe you have already pre-processed data sitting in S3. Maybe you have done some models, uh, some uh, SageMaker models or anything, you have processed everything, you push it to S3, so you have data sitting. Or as simple as the whole data lake is built on API calls. As long as you can make an API call, that's it. You can push data to the data lake. Now this comes, there, there comes the important part. Although this data lake is like a dumping ground for all the data, only once a subscriber asks for a request from the producer and they approve, then only they can start consuming the data. Now currently, again, you can have your own Redshift cluster, you can have a spectrum because maybe, there, maybe the table is in like petabytes, you don't really want to spin up a really big Redshift cluster, so you could have data sitting in spectrum. You can use EMR. All of these are directly linked to the, to the data lake. You can use SageMaker, all of these. Plus, we have also things like interactive notebooks, some internal tools, but again, like interactive notebooks where people can just um, directly consume the data. And again, this is very important. I want to talk a bit more about the whole implementation side of the things. For example, one of the, again, important bits is, like for Amazon, we have lots and lots of data, all the customer data. We want to ensure it's always secure. For that, we use encryption in both transit and at rest. N none of the data ever goes through without encryption. Very important once you have all the sort of customer data. It could be PII data as well. Second bit is, again, sort of the reason I'm going through all this is if you are sort of still, either you have already built a data lake or you are still in a process of building this data lake, Maybe remember these things. It might, it might be very helpful for your users. Now, talking about uh, the next feature, which is like, it's a very nice UI on, built on the top of the data lake for all the non-tech users, say all the business users, maybe a business team. All they want to do is get data from the data lake. They just go to this web UI, click on hit subscribe, it, start, it copies all the data to your Redshift cluster, to Spectrum, or anything else, whatever you want. For uh, tech people, we have all the APIs. 
And again, this is where we sort of, our team built a tool. Again, think about the example. Um, say there is a new BI team in Prime Video. They want to consume maybe 100 data sets across multiple teams. We, we actually built a tool which was built using all the APIs, and within a couple of clicks, it spins up using CloudFormation, it spins up the, the whole AWS infrastructure, copies, fires some API calls to the data lake, starts copying all the data, like hundreds of tables in like few clicks. So APIs are really, really helpful. Next bit, I'm sure many of you have gone through this scenario where maybe you are a producer, you need to now maybe email or text or whatever to your, to your downstream teams that, hey, we are making some changes to the table. Maybe a couple of columns being added, some data type is being changed. It's very difficult once you have, at Amazon scale, you have like hundreds of teams to, to actually uh, email them, try to find their email addresses and email them. And this is sort of inbuilt in our data lake. You go to the UI or using API, there is a section, every time you're making a change, it asks you, hey, what's the information you want to tell them? You, you fill in there, it automatically emails everyone. Then again, this is again, I've highlighted in gold, really important. Uh, now think about a scenario, uh, say you want to watch something on Amazon video. You go to the browser, you start searching, say Jack Ryan. Most probably the first top hit that you get is the actual Jack Ryan that you want to stream. We have pretty similar search engine for our data lake as well. We simply go to the UI, start typing the name, the first top hit of the table is what you want to subscribe. Moving a bit further about the features, um, as I've talked about earlier, it's all role-based. So we ensure and we have a full trail of who made the API call, so everything is tracked. You can't just get away with that. Another important bit, um, so of course, Data Lake is built on top of S3. It's based on partitions. Again, two important concepts, I would say. Uh, a replace partition. Uh, think about it as, say you have a table which is partitioned on, say, date, maybe a start date or something in your, in your system, in your table, I mean. Um, and you could have incremental data coming in every day. You could literally have a new partition of the data every day. Why is it important? Because in downstreams, maybe people don't want to consume the whole table. Because it's partitioned on smaller, uh, smaller partitions on, on this date, downstreams can very easily just consume that specific partition. Now, there could be another scenario where you have data which is constantly updating. So maybe even if you have a partition at a day level, your data always gets updated. Maybe, maybe some playback log. Maybe you started streaming today, but you were on holidays. You streamed on your iPad. It wasn't connected to the internet. Maybe you come back home after a month or so. It connects back and starts logging data back. So you could have those, those scenarios. Again, I've highlighted in gold one of the most important bits uh, of this, of, uh, mo most important features of the data lake. Again, many of you must have gone through this. Say um, you are a data engineering team. There is a source team uh, from where you consume the data. They've made a couple of changes. They've added a couple of columns, dropped a couple of columns. They email you, hey, this is what was, was happening maybe on maybe next Wednesday or something. We're gonna make these changes. Please ensure your pipelines are in good shape. You make all the changes. Okay, maybe then you have a data engineer who goes through, makes all the DDL changes, ensures the ETL is changed as well to consume the extra columns, ensures backfill has run, the whole ETL process has run and fine. Maybe even if they spend a super data engineer, even if they do it in like an hour, think about the Amazon scale again. Say we have like just an arbitrary number, say we have 100 teams who want to do the same thing. If each of them spend an hour, it's like 100 hours for Amazon. Not a good use of time. This is where Data Lake is built in such a way that, say, similar example, a couple of columns got added, and it's a sort of an in-place type uh, partition, in-place type uh, changes. Because it's all columnar based, the Data Lake would actually start pushing. The, it will go create the extra column as a temp table, start pushing the data. Once it's done, it will go and rename the table, both the tables, in a transaction. Similar example for replace type, maybe, the, maybe the, it was a bigger architectural change. But that I mean, maybe table was initially partitioned on, say, month and, say, country ID or something. But now data has grown, so the producer realized, nah, it's, it's a pretty big partition. 
They change the partition to say, at a daily level. This means data might need, we might need to push whole of the table to the, say, Redshift cluster. But again, Data Lake does this, all in the background, goes, connects to your Redshift cluster, creates a new table, syncs all the data, changes the table name in a, in a transaction, which means literally zero downtime for all of these hundreds of downstream teams. So we've saved a lot, a lot of time. Now uh, let's see uh, all of these metrics governance and technologies in action. I'm going to talk about a very specific example uh, of Clickstream. Again, now what, what is a Clickstream? You go to the web Amazon's website, maybe you have searched a few things, maybe you search a toaster. A few minutes later, maybe you have started searching Thursday Night Football or English Premier League. You click play, and this is when actually website asks you to, if you are not logged in, it asks you to, hey, you need to log in to watch this. Now, two things over here. First of all, a lot of clickstream table, a, a lot of clickstream data, it could be, it's in, in like multiple petabytes. We don't, the whole project was to only get a subset of the clickstream, which is related to the prime video. Now, all the toaster searching or every other browsing, prime video, we were not really interested. We wanted to know what is the PV part of it. And this is where comes the business challenges. A very simple example, a very simple question. What is a PV click? Which meant we had to literally go speak to tens of teams because different teams own different services. They manage how, what a page type could be, what a ref tag could be. So we needed to speak to all of these teams to understand what is a PV data, a business challenge. Then again, a very similar use case we also get sometimes bad data. We needed to ensure we have a mechanism in place that suppresses this bad data. And again, um, as I talked about, matrix governance is one of the key features of this whole presentation. This is like a problem which bigger organizations always face. So we needed to ensure that we push through the whole table through matrix governance. With that, um, let me, take an, let me uh, rephrase the same example where you went to the website, you searched, you were not logged in, now you click play, and this asks you to log in. All these previous clicks, we needed to ensure we, because these were not logged in sessions, so we didn't, it was something we were called unrecognized sessions. And we needed to trace it back to your customer ID. So in the metrics governance, because we were producing this data, data set, we did some analysis on last n number of days, trying to figure out which specific number of days or hours actually makes more sense where we should actually go back and start uh, backfilling the table or, or these specific rows with the, with the customer IDs. Once it, was, it had gone through the matrix governance and we decided, okay, this is the right definition, then it moves to the next section. And, and also, we also added um, a few really important flags, things like what type of PV page it is, what subtype of PV page it is. It's just prime video page it is. So it helps downstream other business teams not to write this complex logic. We have written all the logic in functions, and we have produced an easy-to-use data set. Now, uh, let's see how did we do it. Again, uh, starting petabytes and petabytes of data sitting in Amazon S3, which is our data lake, we had to now process this data. It was, again, a very unique challenge. We tried quite a few things. I'm going to talk about what actually worked. So uh, we started with Amazon, uh, in this example, we started with Amazon EMR. We pulled only weekly chunk of data using EMR, converted it into Parquet format, saved into S3, an intermediate storage. This is not the data lake, just another internal uh, R accounts bucket. Now two things, why EMR, why weekly? The first one was very simple. For EMR, uh, two reasons. A, EMR is the technology where it actually decouples storage from compute. We had the storage. Pretty cheap storage, S3, dirt cheap. We needed some compute. Redshift does that, but Redshift uh, has both compute and storage tightly coupled. Now, why weekly? We tried both, daily and monthly. Daily work, monthly didn't, because of the size of the, size of the data. So once we have done this, we moved over to, we moved the data to Redshift. Now, why Redshift? Um, again, all the other tables that we needed to join to enrich our data, multiple tables, 
which, where we had all the business logic or all the other customer flags and other information, that was sitting in Redshift. We did not want it to pull it back to the EMR. And my next slide actually gives a, 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 a nice example why we had to do that. And again, a very important point uh, using Redshift here. We, again, everyone knows about temp tables. We extensively used temp tables for this specific data. What it essentially does, goes to the EMR from the Redshift, sorry, uh, from the S3, it only pulls in a weekly worth of data into a temp table, joins with other bunch of tables, pushes to, a red, to another S3 bucket. Again, an, another intermediate storage, uh, didn't push it back to, to the data lake yet. And we have g gone through this iteration for n number of past years because we had to curate PV-only data for, for last n number of years. Now again, uh, some of you might be wondering why we didn't really push data back to the data lake. Again, this is where um, we all need to kind of understand the limitations or the constraints of your in-house tech. We did some calculations. If we were keep on sending daily or weekly month of worth of data to the data lake, it goes through a specific process, at least in our data lake, where it actually spins up an EMR cluster. It ensures all the rows, all the columns follow a specific pattern. The data is actually validated row by row. We, if we had done that, I think we calculated, it would have taken us like four months to fully backfill the data through going from Redshift to the final data lake. But there was another option within the data lake was if we ensure and we take the guarantee that all the data that we are producing is actually validated, kind of pre-validated, it conforms to all the data types, we could actually directly, once we have got all the data sitting in our S3 bucket, we could directly push it to the, to the data lake. It was like a simple S3 copy from one bucket to another, which finished in like days rather than four months. So again, uh, moving forward, what was, what was the, the technical challenges? Again, there were quite a few. I'm gonna talk about just one, very simple, size of it. It's just petabytes. And again, uh, I would say data was too big financially to be processed in Redshift. When I say financially, I mean we could have very easily spun up 120 node DS2 ATX large cluster, which is at like two petabytes, could have copied all the data, processed it, done. But why? Why shall we use Redshift at 120 nodes, pay that much money when you can actually have um, EMR, which is, which, which is stored uncoupled from storage, and really dirt cheap S3. This is what you have seen in the previous example that we only used EMR and the, and the S3 to process all of the data. And again, uh, another reason was sort of um, using two technologies was we capture all the data into weekly chunks and our Redshift cluster was size accordingly to at least process the weekly worth of data. We didn't really need to spin up a much bigger cluster. Let's, let's talk about an example moving on from this. We had, uh, well, when we needed to join um, two tables, uh, one with 100 billion rows, another with 5 billion rows. Of course, we tried with Amazon EMR, and again, this is sort of maybe taking a step back. We all have uh, a bit of unconscious bias, so I was quite biased with using Amazon EMR because it has kind of worked for us in the past. We used Amazon EMR, uh, R3.8x large, 32 nodes, a similar Redshift cluster, DS2.8x large, 32 nodes. They have quite similar vCPU, quite similar memory, quite similar specifications. But Redshift was 250 times faster as compared to EMR. But why? Now this is again very important to understand. I'm not saying EMR was bad or Redshift was good. This is this is very important distinction to understand why this happened. Biggest reason? Let's talk about EMR first. As a, as a consumer, when we were pulling data from the data lake, we were not in control of how the data was partitioned. The producers, they, 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 are, they are the owners of the data. They, they check what the right partition is based on their, their systems. So they might have partitioned in a different way which we couldn't consume. Secondly, the type of the data, how they stored the data type of it. Whereas uh, for Redshift, we copied all the data onto our cluster. We checked what is the right distribution key. 
and the sort key. So while we were joining these different tables, when they were distributed and sorted on, on the same columns, this, this was the main reason why that shift was quicker. So again, as the slide shows, there isn't, there isn't one size fits all. We need to pick the right technology or a suite of technologies for doing different things. This kind of nicely fits into a couple of uh, Redshift best practices. Actually, a quick show of hands. How many of you have used Redshift? OK, quite a few. Um, I'm going to quickly go through for, for others who, are not, uh, who haven't really used Redshift. Uh, uh, two concepts, very important concept about distribution keys and the sort keys. Think about this as a, maybe you have a business. I'm, I'm going to take a very simple example. You, have, uh, you are in, say, 10 different uh, countries and you have a 10 Redshift, 10 node Redshift cluster, any type of ds 2 large, let's say, and you chose to distribute your data, say, on country ID, maybe someone might, have, might be thinking, yeah, it's a good distribution, so you have each country's data sitting on individual node, and you have 10 different nodes, each is doing its own job, pretty good, good days. Your business grows, you move to the 11th country, because you didn't always want to increase the number of nodes, now suddenly 11th country's data goes back to, say, node one. Now suddenly one of your nodes start processing twice the amount of data it was supposed to, which means suddenly it becomes the bottleneck. So my main point is you need to choose a column with high cardinality, just so that it even it distributes, because it hashes the, the column and it evenly distributes across all the nodes. Second uh, really important point is, if you have multiple tables that you want to join, try to use the same column and the same data type of these tables. Again, we all work for customers. Probably any, any column, customer ID, subscription ID, anything which sort of, uh, which has high cardinality. And again, I'm gonna give an example which we actually, we tried, so by mistake. Uh, we had two different tables. We uh, distributed one of the tables on customer ID, uh, which was integer. The other one, again, customer ID. By mistake, we saved it as character. Both were the same customer IDs, but when we were trying to join the tables, it was distributing, it was broadcasting the tables to all the nodes because of the different data types. So please ensure you have the same data type if you're using the same column where the distribution uh, key tells how, which specific part of the data goes to a specific node, sort key tells how it is actually stored and sorted physically. Now, why do we need sort keys? Mainly either maybe filtering or joining or both. Now think about again uh, an example, maybe the, you have two different tables. Table A, table B, both are, let's say, distributed on customer ID and say sorted on maybe a date, start date, and maybe a, maybe a country ID or something. If you manage to get to a point where two tables are distributed and sorted on the same columns, you leverage something called a merge join in Redshift, which is the fastest join in Redshift. All the data within the same node, within the same slice, always gets computed on that actual node, and the results sent back to the leader node. No data shuffling happens at all, which is the fastest type of join. And another um, a catch point here, try not to use interleave sort keys on monotonically increasing attributes, things like uh, start dates or uh, identity columns. And again, it, it specifically talks about interleaved sort keys, not the compound sort keys. Compound sort keys could be a very good choice, saves on storage, the only catch, again, uh, take a step back, what is the compound sort key? Again, similar example of uh, you have distributed on customer ID sorted on date and say um, a market um, a country ID. Now it needs, um, because it's distributed in such a way, you need to, every time you're joining, you need to ensure you use both the columns in your joins. If you miss any of the columns, say you had a sort key on two or three columns, if you miss any of the, these three columns, you're not going to use, you, you're not going to leverage the actual use of sort key. So ensure if you have compound sort key, you should use all the th two or three columns. Even if it's not needed, please use that. Uh, so that was a clickstream example. Um, moving on to playback. Again, what's the playback? You go onto the website, you've searched for, say, English Premier League, you start playing. The minute you hit play, hundreds of services gets called. 
they check what's your bandwidth, what's your prime status, what's, what type of content should be delivered to you. All of these 100 services, once they have done their job, they deliver the right content to you. Now you've started streaming, this is where analytical teams come into play. I want to talk about a spectrum of reporting which we, which we produce. Uh, first of all is real-time reporting. Like uh, two days ago, we launched EPL, English Premier League, one of the biggest projects in the history of Prime Video. Highest number of TPS, millions of TPS. We, so for, the, for these type of uh, projects, we always need real-time reporting. Maybe business needs every five minutes worth of reporting. And this is, again, sort of business understands that at this specific scale, we choose speed over accuracy. It's not always possible to have fully 100% accurate reports when we are producing real time, and which is okay for us. Then on the other side of the spectrum, we have royalty reportings, all the partner reporting. We never want to underpay them. It's a legal contract we are in. So there we have chosen accuracy over speed. So it's good to understand this distinction. And then in the middle, there's a sweet spot of our usual data warehousing, end of day batch reporting. And this is where sort of my example, this, this specific example fits in. The whole of uh, the, the playback data. Now, um, again, not too fancy. I've like oversimplified this whole process. We have a Redshift cluster where we have gone through, say, all the matrix governance. We have gone through all the definitions that should be implemented on the playback data set, which is actually a join of multiple n number of tables to ensure we provide a consistent table in the data lake. So we pull data from the data lake because all the source teams, they have pushed data to this data lake. Could be service teams, could be other data engineering teams. We pull the data back, apply the business logic, push it back to the data lake. Now this is where, again, a simple scenario. You got Redshift, Spectrum, EMR, SageMaker, any of these downstreams and few others can easily pull the data. Now, again, uh, going back to the scale, because this is at Amazon scale, we had some scenarios where we had to very quickly respond to the business needs. And even this wasn't fully scaling for us. Things like, now, what are the different examples? What is, what is a specific business need? Say, there is a change in business logic. A very good example, a real life example was, initially, so we had a flag, say something called, is it a valid stream? We had all type of streams in that. Then suddenly business decided, actually trailers were not making much sense. It shouldn't be categorized as a valid stream. We quickly removed because we had, so we had to sort of respond to that need. The other example was bad data. We all get bad data. So we had to create a flag called, say, is deleted. It's a simple logical delete. Nothing too fancy, but uh, we had to do that. Third example is events. Uh, again, a real life example. A couple of years ago, we launched auto streams on Fire TV on Amazon, which meant you go into your uh, big screen, your uh, devices, you would see auto streams, which were not customer initiated. And suddenly we saw a huge spike in streams, and we didn't really do any other marketing or anything why there is such a big spike. But to deal with that, we had to, again, think about a quicker way to fix that. The other one, again, highlighted for Redshift guys, they currently not natively support column and row level security. And we had use cases where we needed to do that. Again, we are a, a, another, Amazon is another customer of AWS. However, it resolves that very simple technology, which we all have used, simple database views. It's just, again, taking a step back, um, once we have started moving to the data lakes, we always think in terms of persistent data. It's always tables, or at least in our case, this is what we were thinking. We realized, actually, no, we can actually use the, the good old database views. It's just like a revival of good old database views. What we did, we simply added the view. After we have pushed all the persistent data to the data lake, we have put database views on the top of data lake. How do we use that? How do we do that? We have some orchestration tools written basically some uh, Python code using some orchestration tool. It uh, connects to our GitHub as well. Every time there is a code change, we commit push, it goes and recreates all the, the, the n number of views we have on all the downstream Redshift clusters. We have like n number of Redshift downstream clusters. 
Now, what we actually achieved in this, because it's, we're talking about data at petabyte scale, we couldn't have fully backfilled the table all the time. This view approach, like many times, in many occasions, it saved all the, the data, all the DE teams, BI teams, like hours and hours worth of, uh, worth of time. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what are our 2020 uh, main uh, goals, what we want to achieve. What we have noticed, because we are a data platform team, again, it's a decentralized team. All the individual or the teams sit in different corners. We are the decentralized team. We, we own the platform. And we have noticed now we are becoming a bottleneck. There are like our backlog has grown so much that we can't really deliver all the requests that we have. So we are now trying to invest some time and effort into building a crowdsourced mechanism where, think about it as a data platform, maybe team A has some logic, they, or they have already built a data set, they can push the data set to our platform. There could be other teams, it doesn't need to be us. They can actually go code review and uh, push it to prod. So once it goes through the crowdsource, it would be it would make our lives easier as well. We have things around um, ML anomaly, uh, anomaly detection or stakeholder metadata. A quick example of that is, say we launched a show on 10th of January, and there is a specific reporting which goes on, talks about how many number of streams we had every day. Then suddenly, uh, stakeholders realized, oh, actually, that was the wrong date. Then they create a ticket to us. We go change all of that. Uh, update the data. We are now trying to, again, put some nice UI on the top of our databases, which could actually speak to different databases. It doesn't need to be just Redshift. Or other sort of self-healing pipelines, moving to maybe stream processing. We are still pretty much 90% of our workload is still on batch processing. This is, again, a few things that we want to do. Um, with that, I want to conclude. Again, very, very simple and easy things. This is what we have learned, and I've been with Amazon Prime Video for almost eight years now. This is what I have learned in the last eight plus years. You need to ensure, you need to first of all know who your customers are, who are your skip level customers are, who are even your suppliers. So you need to ensure you go and collaborate early with all of your source teams. You need to check, maybe there is a new launch happening. You need to ensure you talk to them, they have your requirements in there. Maybe you need a couple of extra columns that needs to be there for, that would help you with the reporting. Second thing, you need to be flexible. As I talked about earlier, how I was kind of biased towards using EMR rather than anything else. You need to be flexible. You need to try new technologies. Maybe a technology that worked for you in the past might still work, but there could be 10 other technologies which are cheaper and better. We could have simply used Redshift we would have paid a hell lot of money rather than using EMR on top of um, S3. Very important bit, you need to measure what you build. Again, measuring not just in terms of how many data quality tickets you get. Maybe you're not getting any DQ tickets because no one is actually using your data sets. So we have a very specific metric within Prime Video. We measure the adoption of our data sets. We send out these surveys at a regular cadence. We, we review them, we actually go speak to the teams to, to, who have answered that they are not 100% using our data sets to ensure what's, where is the gap. And then again, of course, goes without saying, you need to build for future, not just in terms of technology. Of course, everyone is intelligent enough, they always plan for future. But think about launches. Maybe there is a future launch and you could vision that maybe you might get similar type of launches. Do not build specific solutions. Every time we try to build, we try to build more generic solutions that could cater for all of these uh, future launches. Because again, even think about Amazon, uh, the Prime Video, we're like 200 plus countries and territories. We need to always plan for even a, a smallest event could cause big troubles for us. So we always plan for all the, all the future events. And of course, if we can partition, we can scale. I do have, um, again, we have all been through this five days of reInvent. I personally always wanted like a slide in probably all the presentations that we could actually uh, have like a key takeaways um, from the whole like one hour presentation. I'm gonna summarize that. For the data lake, we talked about managed schema changes, how rather than 
all the DE teams, they create, they make all the changes. Data Lake could actually push. The second point in the Data Lake is about the views on top of Data Lake. And again, if you are still building Data Lakes or you still have a data lake and you are thinking about uh, improving them. And if only if you have a use, you don't need to do this, only if you have a use case where you don't want to change or backfill petabytes of data, you can just create views on top of them. Architecture evolution, really, really important. You need to understand the constraints of your in-house technology. Like the case of EMR, you know, the, the example I gave, EMR joined with uh, two tables, 100 billion versus 5 billion. EMR wasn't scaling, not because of EMR, because of the the, the storage type and the partition type of the data. So we need to understand, and we need to do like data-driven POC. Amazon is a pretty much doc, we have like a doc environment. We always write documents. So you need to have the right amount of data in your documents. So you go present to the various teams, you have a healthier discussion. Uh, another important point, uh, which I did mention, uh, but not in detail, around the EMR cluster which we used. Again, uh, within Amazon, we have a centralized pool of EMR clusters. You could choose between small, medium, large, or extra large. Think about an org who has maybe hundreds of BI teams. Not all the teams have the knowledge to spin up an EMR cluster, use it, spin it down. That's, that's the best way. Maybe teams can only just spin up a cluster and they believe it's, it's, it's okay enough to use them, keep it uh, running for whole of 24 hours. But as an org, we've resolved for this by having a pool of clusters, pool of EMR clusters, where teams who have contracts where they want to, say, use, um, own, they have a contract where they want to process all the data, say, between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. So they get that slot. Maybe in our case, because it wasn't a mission critical, we were only backfilling, we always used towards the end of the day when there wasn't much happening in these EMR clusters. So if you have a requirement in your org and it's big enough, you could actually have a pool of EMR clusters. Uh, with that, of course, I wanna say there is a lot of AWS training and material around big data, there are classroom offerings, you can do certifications, with that, I'm gonna open for questions if you have any. Thanks.